we know that the lead risk, what this is doing, as you can see the club face is moving around with this, right? So we would call this extension, we call this flexion, and specifically to the average player, they battle and slice, which means the face is too open to whatever path that they're swinging on. For the average player, put their left wrist into that flex position to begin with. Then they don't have to move that way during the swing. But if they would learn to go to the top and just practice putting their left wrist in flex position or at least a much more neutral position so it's not extended, see how that club face automatically now is at a different inclination. So now they can just learn to maintain that wrist action, then come down. The club face is already in a much, much better position for them. That also allows this club to just shallow a little bit just by the action of this going into a flexion. So it accomplishes a lot of things. I would like to coach amateur players the importance of that. I think that could really change how they go about the golf swing in general. Wow, that looks good. Chris, welcome to Hallworth. Thanks, thanks for having me. That looked all right for an old guy? Oh yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> I'm excited about today. I am too, this will be fun. I believe we got ourselves a golf fan. One of my favorite people to talk golf swing with is Grant Waite. His unique perspective comes from his playing career where he won on the PGA Tour, and his coaching career where he's worked with top players like Charles Howe III and Trevor Immelman. Our friendship stems from our mutual interest in all things coaching. But I've always admired his golf swing. Some coaches even use it as a model for their own students. I traveled to Iowa's Country Club in Orlando, Florida to catch up with Grant and see the intricacies of his swing. Grant, in 1995, you led the tour in total ball striking. That is absolutely perfect. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you were doing going into that year to work on your own game, which in turn obviously translated to some incredible play? Chris, I was fortunate enough to meet Mac Grady at the end of 94. He was gracious enough to help me with my game. For everybody at home, Mac Grady won multiple times on tour and it has become this guru of sorts. A guru of sorts because he could not only talk about what he was doing, but he could demonstrate it both right and left-handed. During that period of time, what Mac was kind of counted to a lot of the instruction that was going on in the mid-90s. Restrict the lower body, you get your arms down in front of your body, you're powering the swing with the speed of your arm. He can swing it right-handed, he can swing it left-handed. The swing is a wonderful golf swing. Through the research that he had done, first thing he wanted me to do was have this nice free turn and have the right hip move back around, lose flex in my right knee, and allow this hip segment to get deeper and higher on the back swing. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. jump in here? Yeah, sure. Here. Okay, so you take me through a little bit. Okay, so what we're gonna do is you're gonna get set up, I want you to have your focus over on this right side, on your right leg, okay. right hip, and I just want you to take that hip and turn it, so it's gonna turn, that's right. Now when you do it, you're trying to have a free turn, no restriction, you gotta lose some flex in that right leg, and you just demonstrated that perfectly. And I feel like my trail hip's actually higher than my left a little Correct. bit. Correct, it should give a slant to that hip. So for me right here, I still feel like my hip's inside my feet. I don't feel like I'm, you know, kind of getting sloppy in my ankle. Yes. But this is still pulling back and straightening Right, well a turn is different than just a slide on the way back. Sure. So I'm gonna allow that to turn. Now remember, the premise was the ball's on the ground, so what we're gonna have to do, if I'm turning this way, if you look from behind me, I'm gonna have a slant to my hips, I'm gonna slant to that shoulder plane, that shoulder tilt, because I gotta transport my arms downward because the ball's on the ground. If the ball was horizontal and I'm swinging this way, there wouldn't be any of that. You'd see how I turned there on that, that horizontal. Okay, so, so I'm turning on this angle of sorts. Yep, should allow the right hip to go back and up and get this hip slant, and then my shoulder plane is going to be also tilted down towards the ground. Okay, is that right? The ball's on the ground. That is exactly right. Okay. When I first went to him, I didn't have a free enough turn there, and my shoulder plane was a little bit too flat. I see. I said, okay, fair enough. Bobby Jones, all the way up through those areas, up to Jack Nicholas and beyond, they had this big free turn. They allowed that to happen, pop right. and so forth. 
Another thing that we did was the clock phase. He preferred a stronger grip. We'd take the left hand and turn it over and I could see at least two and a half knuckles, okay. sometimes more. Also at the top, so my left wrist was a little bit more in a flat position, which because of the stronger grip that led that club face to be already a slightly closed position, mm -hmm. but that just made it easier on the way down that this was already orientating towards the ball. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to have where it was open and try and uh, put a torque or a twist on this grip hand in order to square the face. It allowed me to think less about what was going on with the club face and yes. more about what's going on with my body and how am I swing with my body. But it also allowed you to feel sort of very quiet in the face and have a fall through motion that didn't have a lot of kind of roll and flip to it. And you did some drills yeah. that helped train that as well. That's correct. One of the favorite drills that he would have me do would be a long arc drill. A long arc just means that I'm going to not shorten the arc or relax very fast. Okay. The responsibility to be in my pivot, set all these alignments in the club phase and allow that to happen, but keep my pivot powering. Can you show us what that looks yeah. like real quick? Yeah. Maybe hit a ball? Sure. So the idea would be stronger grip, the free turn on the way through, a long arc. For the viewers at home who tend to chicken wing, yep. this is the opposite of that, right? This is really training you to keep that lead arm from folding down that way. The idea being that this left shoulder and this whole left side at some point is getting out of the way, going back, up, and around, which is continuing to power my arms trailing and throw my arms at the ball. Right, and this structure is what a lot of amateurs need to learn to not do that dreaded chicken wing or scooping. Pass. Yeah, for sure, and I see that a lot. The amateurs come in and they have a lot of this going on, right? So when you have that, you've got a lot of stuff going on with the club face, also the, the rate of passing, the club head passes my hand, it does a lot of things with the trajectory, the ability to hit the ground, where the club head's going, lots of things. Coming up. My contact wasn't perfect. The ball could literally go a foot mm -hmm. in front of me. And so contact became iffy. You get afraid of contact. 